بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العلم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما ورزقنا فحم النبيين وحفظ المرسلين اللهم افتح لنا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام وصل اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الكرام ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم ونعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and a warm welcome to everyone um, الحمد لله so inshallah we'll be continuing on from where we stopped last time in in the in the text um, I had a I had a just before coming into the class I had a quick glance at the discussion you guys were having in the in the group and uh, alhamdulillah I'm actually, I would like to say I'm, I'm really pleased to see that and uh, even though I didn't respond because I just saw it like a few minutes ago I'm, I'm very happy to see that such a discussion going on and I'll, I'll encourage you to keep doing that keep going at it um, I was also very happy to just to see that you are using uh, you are doing it intellectually and uh, you are applying what I would call an intuitive logic to it. So that's a good sign as well I mean, when, when someone does that because you can study logic as a science to really understand it but by their very nature human beings they do logic. Logic is Im embedded into us. Um, we are logical beings. So. Uh, Alhamdulillah. So I would say just keep going with the discussion even though I don't respond to it. Uh, don't, don't wait for me to come in and, and, and do all that. Uh, I will just, you know, encourage you to keep doing it yourself. Keep engaging in a discussion, a discourse, ask questions back and forth, do a bit of research on your own and keep the discussion going. Otherwise, you know, something like that, the, it just dies out and loses its, its momentum and its traction and, and, and you don't want that. So inshallah so let's uh, proceed with the text and uh, the section we're going to be looking at uh, I, I, if we have time i'm going to do two sections if not most likely we'll end up just doing one section which is uh, faslun kayfa uh, ta'rifu nafsak the section on how to know yourself so we looked at the first section was the importance of knowing the self and uh, why you should know yourself what, what does it ultimately lead to? And now, how do you actually do it? So you can see also in the text, as Ghazali is laying out, he's applying logic as a blueprint. Because the, the logical inquiry, the, the mannerism in which you come to arrive at a rationality of things, begins with, uh, it, there, there are five fundamental questions that go with it. Typically, there are three the other two are related to time and space. But the three that are most important is the, the what, um, the how and whether, and then the why. So it could be how, you could, you could be asking about the howness of a thing, or you could be asking about whether it's this or whether it's that in a form of sort of elimination uh, and then zeroing in on, a, on, a, on, a, on something specific so that it can be ratified. So these three are fundamental in logic. You have at the sawara sadij and then you've got the sawara sadij then you've got tasdiq and then you've got qiyas so the first question is what you would call mahiyatun you know what is it the, the foremost grasping of a thing and then you examine how it is or whether it's this or whether it's that and then you finalize ultimately with the reasoning behind it and that's the blueprint that Ghazali is following and he follows it in all his books and, and all the scholars uh, of our, our tradition, you know, the brilliant ones, this is the blueprint that they always follow because it appeals directly to the logical blueprint of the human being. So he, he, he spoke about what the, the soul is or what is the importance of knowing the soul and the self. Now he's talking about how do you come to know the soul or the self. 
So he begins by saying, إِذَا شِئْتَ أَنَّ تَعْرِفَ نَفْسَكَ أَنْ تَعْرِفَ نَفْسَكَ فَعْلَمْ أَنَّكَ مِنْ شَيْئَيْنَ If you want to know yourself, if you wish to know yourself, you should know that you are of, of two compositions. Now he's relating to the inward self, not the outward. In essence, you are, you are, you are, you are three in composition. You are the body, the soul, the spirit. Now he's relating to the inward aspect where he's saying in the inward aspect you are two. In the outward aspect you are one, the body. In the inward aspect there are two aspects to your being. Al-awwalu hadha al-qalb wa thani yusamma nafs wa ruh The first of this is the heart, the qalb. And then the other is of this is you would call the soul or the spirit. Now it's important to understand here because scholars will often use these terms interchangeably. Because in one aspect you are dealing with different entities, in another aspect these entities are more or less one and the same. Because when the soul behaves in a righteous manner, it can be called a spirit. Because it's the, the spiritual aspect is, is a righteous, righteous aspect. And then when the soul is behaving in, 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 a, in, a, in a vile, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an evil aspect, then it takes on a different form or a different term or it becomes separated from the spirit. So the word nafs in, in Arabic depends on, because in Arabic the language is not, is not reliant only on what you would call in linguistics logical semantics. You have to examine logical semantics as well as contextual semantics in Arabic, particularly with scholarly works, with literature, and with the scriptures. Logical semantics are things like what a word, what's its definition, um, is it a noun, is it a verb, you know, is it, uh, is it in the accusative sense, is it in, is, is, all those things, right? The, 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 the semantic, the logical semantics of it, what's the placement of the word in the sentence, and what does it mean insofar as the dictionary is concerned. Contextual semantics will differ. And oftentimes the contextual semantics will override the logical semantics. So the, the word ruah means spirit as far as the dictionary is concerned. And, 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 and the scholars say aslu lugha haqiqa. The, the asal of language is its literal form. So you always have to look at the logical form first. What is the word's definition? And does that definition fit into the context in which the word is being used? That's the foremost thing. You see, so the word ruah means spirit. The word nafs means soul. Now, when it comes to the contextual use, contextually, the word, the, the, the soul can be referred to as a ruah, contextually. And so you have to determine now in the statement that's being given, is it, being, is it referring to the spirit or is it referring to the soul when it is being spiritual? And in some contexts, the word nafs can also be referring to the characteristic of the soul and not necessarily the composition of the soul, like the self, for example. So it could be used in a negative connotation denoting the self. So in one aspect, there is the body and then in another aspect is its characteristic. And you'll also see further along, I don't know if it's in this section or in one of the other sections, Ghazali actually refers to the body, the physical body, as qalib. He uses the same word as qalb, the, the, the same root derivation as qalb to refer to the physical body. And in the context of it is where you have to understand it. You can't apply translation and then apply logical semantics on the translation to derive the meanings and understandings. This is where people always get confused what trying to you know, visualize how do these entities fit together? Like, how does it work together? <laughs> the, the soul, now he's not referring to the self, he's referring to the soul. The soul is the heart that is, is, is when, when you apply your inward eye, the Ayn al by which you, 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 by which you can see using your inner eye. So when you're using your inner eye, as far as the soul is concerned, 
you are actually using your heart now. وَالنَّفْسُ هُوَ الْقَلْبُ الَّذِي تَعْرِفُ بِعَيْنِ الْبَاطِلِ The soul is the heart with which you understand as the inward eye. وَحَقِيقَتُكَ الْبَاطِنِ And your reality, your true reality is an inward reality, not the outward form. Your true reality is not the outward form. So any characteristic that you would associate with the outward aspect of your being is not your true reality. It is just a representation of it. One of the poets said, uh, Muhammad ibn al-Habib, he said, the Moroc- he's a, he was a Moroccan uh, scholar, he said, إِنَّمَا الْكَوْنُ مَعَانِي قَائِمَةٌ بِالصُّوَرِ كُلُّ مَنْ يُدْرِكُ هَذَا كَانَ مِنْ أَحْلِ الْعِبَرِ That indeed the world is but meaning erected as form. It's not the form that provides the meaning. It is the meaning that brings out the form. So everything you see in the world, it's not the form that is its true reality. It is still a reality, but it's not the form that is true reality. It is what's in, in internally realized of it is that that's the true reality. And that's why when a human being looks at an object and asks, what is it? He's not referring to the form, he's referring to what that form represents. And the action of knowing what it is, is the action of abstracting its essence, abstracting its reality to bring it into the heart as understanding what the thing is. This is again where a deficiency in the English language um, incapacitates your understanding of it. Because in Arabic, there is a distinguishment done between what you would call a material reality and what you would call an essential reality where the essential reality is, is the true reality, and that's what you would call haqiqa. And then the material reality is, the, is what you would call realistic. And the term for that is waqi'iya. Waqi'iya means realistic. It's not real itself, it is realistic. It's representing the real. So the form represents the meaning. In the same way that the symbol or the sign does not represent itself, it represents something else, you see? And also, everything in creation is a sign, a sign of what? A sign of the one who created it. Because it is a created thing, it necessitates a creator, you see? And there was something else I was going to say there. If you, uh, so if you look in the, at the English language, when you look at the word reality and you trace its etymology, it originates from the Latin word reas. And reas means thing, material, matter, good, or property. You see? It's related to physical objects. Because a thing is made from matter. It's material. And a good is like a manufactured thing. You take matter, you put it all together, you assemble it, you manufacture, and then you have goods to sell. And a property is a good that you own. You go and you purchase goods, you now own them. It's your property. You see, embedded in the English language, the definition of reality is related to material reality. And this is because the English language is a purely analytical language. It's quantitative. It's not a qualitative language. It struggles to come close to a qualitative reality using poetry, English poetry. Is, is beautiful when it is properly constructed, but it doesn't give you more on the side of true reality. The Arabic language is, is a synthetic language. It has incredible inflection, and it, and, and it is a language where the, the, the phoneme, the harf that is uttered, each letter has a meaning in reality to what it represents. Each letter has a meaning in reality. So, for example, if you take the word nafs, now, if you take, so, so if you take the word soul, for example, other than you getting a dictionary definition of soul, it will not give you anything else. You can't take that word with S-O-U-L, those, those phonemes, the s, uh, and, and u, and then, and, uh, and the l, you cannot take those phonemes 
and say maybe reconfigure them and derive more of an understanding about the entity that you're referring to, meaning the soul. But you can do that with Arabic. So if you look, if you those who have a, like your dictionaries and whatnot uh, there, if you, you want to open it up, you can. I have a list of words that I put together. I wanted to do this exercise with everyone, but I didn't really think it through how it would be performed. So if you have a dictionary with you, you can open it up on your side. If you look at the word nafasa, nafasa is the root word of nafs in the bab fathu fathi, the, the, the trilateral root of fatha and fatha. Now in the Arabic language, the, the first letter is usually the genus of the word. And then the second letter is the differentia of the word. And then the third letter is the species. It tells you what specific meaning or what specific entity is related to that word. So typically the differential, the middle piece determines uh, which category it's going to fall under. So the, the general category of it is the noon category. And the nafa there associates it to something that is related to the nafs, to the soul. So nafasa means to breathe. And that's the first prime definition of the soul. Because it's the soul that's breathing in the human being. It's not the lungs. The lungs are not breathing. The lungs are performing the function of pumping air in and out. It's a device. It's a machine. The lungs are not breathing. It's the soul that's breathing. You can replace the lungs with something else. Like, you know, when they, they put like respiratory devices, um, like in the hospital, you can replace the lungs with a different device. It's not the lungs that are breathing. If you take the lungs out and replace it with something else, the soul can still breathe, technically speaking. It's the soul that's breathing. That's the characteristic of the soul, expanding and contracting, expanding and contracting. The soul is what's breathing. If you look at Bab Fathu Dhammi, Nafusa, it means precious. And the soul is a precious entity. And this is why we regard life to be precious. If you look in Surah Al-Kaf, when, when, um, when Musa, when, when, when Al-Khadr kills the boy, Musa gets very upset. And then tells him, and you, look, you can look at the ayah, look at the words that are used there. I'm not going to, I'm going to recite the ayah. This is, is going to be your homework. Look at the ayah, look at the words he uses there. I'm going to translate that. Have you killed an innocent soul, a pure soul? He doesn't refer to the body. He doesn't say you killed somebody. You see, you kill because the soul is precious. Life is associated with the soul existing in this world. Life is not associated with the body. Life is associated with the soul. The body is just the vessel. If you look at nafisa, it means to be envious. Jealousy is an inherent quality of the soul. It, it's, it's envious. It desires what others have. And then there is, there is some envy that's prideful, uh, that's, that's blameworthy. And there is some envy that is, that is praiseworthy. It's good to be envy about certain things. You see, like you have, uh, your friend has got, you know, has got, let's say, he, he, he studied and he's, he's acquired so much knowledge. And you can say, I'm envious of that. It's not a bad envy, in which case you then, you know, throw hazard on the individual. It's a good envy that can enable the soul to desire to learn, to desire to seek knowledge in desiring what the other person has. So. Some envy is good, some envy is, is not good. If you look at nafasa, where the, the differentia is extended by an addition, uh, additional letter of the same. So nafa, nafa, fasa. The one of the fa is silent. That's why you put a shadda on top and you merge the two. Nafasa means to be cheerful, to be joyous, to, to feel pleasant. If you look at nafasa, it means to compete, right? فَلْيَتَنَافَسِ الْمُتَنَافِسُونَ um, You see, to compete because it's man's nature to, to be competitive with himself and then with other selves, with other souls of his kind. If you look at nafida, you take out the, the scene now, you put a dal. You look at nafida, it means to be, to sort of, uh, to be used up, to be spent. Or to be exhausted. 
if you look at nafida it means to be uh, like to come to an end now you go through your whole cycle and then now you're sort of withering out nafida nafada if you look at now change the dal and you put let's say a jim nafaja means to boast to be boastful oh i am you see this is what i did i went here i did that i did this that's to be boastful nafaja if you change that you put nafaha nafaha is now related to the original nafasa because the soul is a breathing entity and the ha there is the harf that in that uh, in that example it relates directly to the meaning so if you look at the way the ha is uttered it's uttered with a soft uh, breath nafaha in this case means like a soft breath right nafaha if you change that and you put a kha there it becomes a restricted breath nafaha nafaha wa nafakhtu fihi min ruhi and i so it's a kind of a blow a heavy blow a, 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 an abrupt force of a blow right min sharri min sharri nafathati fil aqad there are those who blow on the knots the the they they do i don't want to talk about that that's witchcraft um, but that's how they do it they actually they do their spell work and then they do their blowing on it um if you look at nafaha if you add an alif there between the noon and the fa nafaha means to protect to 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 defend and how do you defend you present you put a force in the front remember i talked about the fort with the with the walls right you have the outer defense that's what the outer defense does it tries to hold back the enemy you see that powerful gust of of blowing in allegory or in analogy can be can be associated with that to try and push something away from you in 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 your defense if you look at the ain now if you replace the 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 kha with ain you have nafa'a which means to benefit to be useful you see the soul the, you have to be a useful individual a useful person a benef, benef, of benefit to others and, and to yourself as well um, and and so the same root word is applied in in terms of let's say talking about success right like allah says in in surah al mu'minun uh, no not surah al mu'minun um, surah al shura uh, yawma la yanfa'u يوم لا ينفع نفع ينفع مال ولا بنون on that day nothing will benefit لا ينفع nothing will benefit from their wealth or their legacy then if you if you replace the ain with qaf you get nafaqa nafaqa means to to sell which is related to the inherent nature of man in in trade and business we are not designed to 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 work as slaves this is something i mean this i could actually go into a completely different discussion about this human beings were not designed to work as slaves even with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even though you are his servant you are still in a trade with him you are in a negotiation with him if you do this he will give you this if you do that it will cost you this it's always trade this is this is the human being is 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 by nature a businessman is not and 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 the human being on this level that tries to turn that that's why you have a dominant workforce now in today's age as compared to the as compared to you know going into the our ancestors there was a larger um population a larger percent of the population were traders and merchants and a smaller population was a workforce and the workforce only got into the workforce so that they could learn the 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 trade really in the us in the in the early like in the 50s in the in the 40s 50s uh, even earlier than that people used to go into a certain workforce i i would actually say before the world war uh before world war 1 where people were then compelled to actually get jobs as workers people would go into a trade as apprentices they would just go in to learn the trade for a couple of years 
and so that they could now go and start their own trade in the same field. That's, that's the whole idea of why now that's set, set as the standard. If you're going to start your business, you're given all this negativity, or it's going to fail, it's going to do this, it's going to do that, you have this problem, that problem. I, I had somebody actually once told me when I wanted to start my own business, oh, you're just buying yourself another job. You know, you're just buying yourself a permanent job. It's this kind of mentality that people have nowadays. It's, it, it's, it goes against the nature of the self. And that's why a lot of people in employment are typically the ones who face the most depression. Because they are under subjugation. Ultimately, they feel like they are under subjugation. Anyway. And, and, and this is where also the, the word nafaqa, this is where you also get the derivative of nafaqa. Nafaqa is, the, is where now you get the word munafiq. Because selling off, when you ultimately sell off yourself, that's a munafiq. A hypocrite is someone who trades himself, <laughs> right? You sell your soul, you betray your, your, your creed, you betray your people. That's a munafiq. Um, and then you change the, the qaf. So you, you see the qaf there, it's a heavy letter. And this, this is, if you look at the word thaqil, thaqala means something is heavy. So the tha and the qaf in there are the huruf that are heavy. And so the qaf there, the nafaqa, that's a heavy burden the, cell, the soul has to go through. When you become a hypocrite, it's not actually freedom. A hypocrite is and there's somebody who is always then looking over his shoulder. Because he's afraid he will get caught. He's not actually free. If you replace the qaf with the tha, tha is also a heavy letter. And that tha now is related to the nafakha and the ha, it's related to the breath. The tha is, is, the, is the breath that is like spitting breath. Yeah, actually, I made a mistake in that ayah that I quoted. It's min shari min nafathati. Um, I, 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 I associated it to the other one. Min shari nafathati fil uqad. The spitting breath. Those who blow on the, on the, on the knots. Then you have nafada with the dad. Nafada means to shiver. You know, you get that fright. Um, and then you feel like a shudder running down your spine. That's the manifestation of it. That's not the actual... Shiva. The actual shiva is what the soul is feeling. The soul is now suddenly trembling. That's what it means. Nafada. You, you get into a state of sli a slight tremble, like something is about to happen. Um, and then you look at the huruf al illa the three letters alif, ya, uh, alif, ya, and then wow, as, as interchangeable in the nafa. So you, they all relate to the same thing. They relate to like a, uh, a rejection or a prohibition or a refusal. So nafa and then and then nafa with the with the maksura and then nafawa, which is where the actual root comes from, means to reject, to deny, to oppose, to prohibit. And this is the nature of the self. See, the nature of the consciousness is to affirm. The consciousness was was created to affirm reality and hence to affirm the creator of reality. But there is the, the filter of the soul. We're going to talk about the filters later on, inshallah, in the text. Ghazali will talk about the filters. Filters of the senses and then filters of the soul. The filter of the soul comes in between the, the nature of the being and his affirmation of, of God Almighty. So if you look in, in Surah Al-A'raf, that ayah, when he asked Allah to be Rabbikum, the response came back, Bala shahidna. We affirm and we testify reality. Or we affirm that you are our Lord. In that state, there was no filter. It is going to be the same state that everyone is going to be in on Yom Al-Qiyamah. فَكَشَفْنَ anka ghitaq, When all the veils have been removed from you. And now you're able to see Clearly, without any filters, it's going to be the same state. It's going to be a state of affirmation. You cannot deny. This is why he also says, Woe unto those on that day who deny. Woe unto you. You can deny right now, but you will not be able to deny on that day because the filters are removed. The filter of the self is the filter of denial. 
And so this is why if you look at the kalima, it's been designed to first break the self. It comes with a negation first. La ilaha, a negation. There is no other deity. Uh, other deity. Illallah. And then comes the affirmation after you overcome the self. Because you cannot have faith in God or realize His unity when you are veiled by the self. By the self. So that's the, the nafa, that's a quality of the self. It rejects. And this is why he says also, uh, he, he proportioned the self, the soul, and inspired it both with vice and virtue. The one who has succeeded is the one who purifies it. In other words, removes these veils from himself. The one who fails, the loser, is the one who dasaha, objects it or creates an obstacle. Dasa means to, to drive a wedge between something and its inclination and what it is attracted to. You, you sort of put an, a, a force and obstacle there. That's the self. It's not the nafs. It's not the soul in its praiseworthy attribute. It is the self in its, in its blameworthy attribute. And that's the nafa. Now, that doesn't mean, that doesn't relate to everything. Because there are certain things you do have to reject. You see? So you, it is a quality of the self. It is in the self. And now it is incumbent upon you how you're going to use that quality. Because there are certain things that you do have to reject. You do have to oppose. And that's why it has been put in you. And this is why consciousness does both affirmation and negation. In logic, you affirm and then you negate. If you ask a question, okay, what is that? Is it this or is it that? It's not that. Therefore, it is this. You see, you negated that one and then you accepted this one. You affirmed this one. If you look at now, replace that, sh replace the scene with sheen, you have nafasha, it means to swell up. To become like, you know, you feel this joy and you just feel like you're inflating. <laughs> uh, now that can also be applied negatively. Because you can swell up with anger. You can, you can swell up with joy, with true joy. But then you can also be inflated with anger. If you look at now, replace the sheen with ra. You get nafara. It means to flee, to run away. To, 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 to hide somewhere, you see, and that's the nature of, uh, if you look at psychology, it's fight or flee. <laughs> you either face your, your obstacle head on or you run away from it. Fight or flee is not a, 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 an agent of the body, it's an agent of the soul. If you look at, if you add the fa there and becomes nafara, it means to alienate yourself. To go into isolation, I want to be alone, just leave me alone. I don't want to talk to anyone, I don't want to see anyone. You see, the soul does that. It's, a, it's, a, it's part of your psychology there. Something happens to you, you hear bad news, just leave me alone. Or you get upset, you get angry or something, just leave me alone. You alienate yourself, you hide yourself somewhere. And, and the elongation of that, if you put an alif on that, you get nafara. Nafara means to sort of avoid. Um, to, it, all, it can also mean to contradict or to, to be incompatible with. So it's like, it's part of that same negation of something. So I don't want to know, or I don't want to be near this other person. It means that you're not compatible right now. Um, so you just want to avoid that, uh, that individual, you want to stay away from them. Or what they are saying is not gelling with you. So you are contradicting them. You see, you're both contradicting each other. And so a separation and an isolation is in effect at that point. I mean, and this just, these are just a few words that I took as sort of trilateral roots to give you an understanding of if you look at, number one, the Arabic language and how it can elaborate for you the reality of things in terms of understanding what things are. And then number two, the, the, the qualities of the self are 
expansive in all these different aspects. When you want to understand the reality of a thing, it's psychology in this case, the self, the psychology, you've got all these different qualities that can be blameworthy, that can be praiseworthy, that can be, um, you know, it's all now incumbent on you to decide, to understand how you are going to apply them, how you're going to use them. And this is now what he means by, this is your other aspect. The first is the qalb, the, the heart, which makes your decisions for you. It is the heart that intellects on a higher level. And then you've got the soul, which in one aspect, when it is being spiritual, when it is using these qualities in a praiseworthy manner, it could be, it, 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 it is inclined towards the spirit. It's being spiritual. Because to be spiritual is to be righteous, is to be pious, is to be virtuous. And then in the other aspect, it can be just the self. It's related to the self. It's only concerned with itself. And these are when all these qualities that we mention become, you know, negative qualities. They are not applied in a positive manner. They are applied in a negative manner. So he says, لِأَنَّ الْجَسَدَ أَوَّلٌ وَهُوَ الْآخَرُ وَالنَّفْسُ آخِرٌ وَهُوَ الْأَوَّلُ وَيُسَمَّ قَلْبًا So, because the body, you have to understand this in Arabic, but I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate it. Uh, let me just translate it for you first. Because the body is the first and it is the last. And the soul is the last and it is the first. And it is the heart. In other words, what he's saying is that in terms of your understanding of it, the body is outwardly first. The first thing is the body. You understand the body and then you go further as your understanding expands. Then you come to the soul and then you go further from the soul and then you come to the heart. So the body is the first, the heart is the last in that regard. And then, وَالنَّفْسُ آخَرُ وَهُوَ الْأَوَّلُ And the soul is the last and it is the first, the heart is the first. Because the heart was created first and then the heart was placed inside the soul. So the soul is the last as far as its ethereal dimension is concerned. Your spiritual side is concerned. The heart is the first and the, the soul is the last. And it is the heart. وَهُوَ الْقَلْبِ وَيُسَمَّ قَلْبًا And it and it is called the heart. And which means that the heart is the first and it is the last. As far as your being is concerned. It is the first thing that was created for you. And it will be the last that will carry onwards into the next phase of your existence. With it will be all your memories, all your knowledge, all your deeds and your actions. Everything that you performed that you engaged in in this world are all going to be affiliated with the heart. It is going to be the last. You will leave the body in this world. The soul will be placed in a quote-unquote dimension of timelessness and spacelessness. You are, you're not going to, after you die, when you die, when you're put into the grave, your body is put into the grave, your soul is in a spaceless and timeless dimension in which there are no events that can be quantified. There is no progression of events. You see, people wonder, okay, so if somebody died, let's say, you know, um, a thousand years ago, and let's say uh, the Yom Al-Qiyamah is another th thousand years from now, do they have to wait two thousand years, like until they get resurrected for judgment? They're not actually going through two thousand years of time. Time is only in this world. Time is in this physical world. Time doesn't extend outside the physicality of the physical borders. There's no time in, in death. There is no time in when you go to sleep in, in the dream state. There's no time. Um, there's no time when you cross over the dimensions, you start moving into a state of timelessness. So they're not actually waiting 2000 years. As far as they're concerned, They've, they, they've gone, they've died, they've left this world and it's like in the next moment they have, res they have been resurrected. It's Yom al Qiyamah. <laughs> it's very hard to explain but that, that's not our discussion here. But inshallah when we do the course on time and cosmology, I gave you guys um, four different options. So when we come to that course inshallah, that will be an interesting topic of discussion. 
وليس القلب هذه القطعة اللحمية التي في الصدر من جانب الأيسر لأنه يكون في الدواب والموتى And the heart is not this mound of flesh that is inclining towards the left in the chest that is inclining towards the left. It's not this mound of flesh, this, this physical organ. Because animals and, and dead things, they also have that. The corpse, a corpse has got a, a heart, a physical organ. A body has got a heart, a physical organ. Animals have that. He's not referring to that. We're not talking about that heart. This physical organ with the valves and the pumping and all that. It's got its place. It is a vessel for the spiritual heart. وَكُلُّ شَيْءٍ تُبْصِرُهُ بِعَيْنِ الظَّاهِرِ فَهُوَ مِنْ هَذَا الْعَالَمِ أَلَّذِي يُسَمَّ عَالَمَ الشَّهَادَ Everything, and this is very important. This is incredibly important. Because this is something that the modern world has done a very good job and credit where it's due. Even if it's the devil, they've done a very good job of indoctrinating people. Anything that you can see with your physical eyes is part of the observable universe. Alam shahada the observable world or the observable universe. Anything that you can see with your eyes, even if you are going to use instrumentation, magnifying glass, microscope, whatever else you're going to use. That includes your quanta. If you can use instruments made of matter, made of material to detect something like particles, you know, like you have this, they have the CERN uh, accelerator, the centrifugal accelerator. They have instruments that detect, detect the particles when they are fired. If you can detect anything using an instrument, it is not part of the unseen. It is part of the seen realm. It is part of alam shahada. It is part of the physical universe. If you cannot detect it, you cannot apply any sort of instrumentation to it, it is part of alam al-amr. It is an unseen entity. And this is why in modern science, consciousness is a huge problem. And when we say problem, in, in science, is, a problem is not an obstacle. Like you use it in, in, you know, I have a problem now, I need to deal with it, you know, in conventional speech. In the sciences, a problem is a technical term. It's a problem meaning it needs to be solved. So science works with frameworks. Each science has a framework within which it operates. And those frameworks, the rules that are used in that framework can be true so long as they're applied within the framework. When you start crossing over frameworks, it becomes a, a big problem because now you can't explain other things. So consciousness is one of those problems. How do we come to know what we know? How, do we, how are we able to, to affirm and negate? Einstein, for instance, said, the only thing I find incomprehensible incom about the universe is our comprehensibility of it. The only thing I can't understand is how we are able to understand it. How are we able to understand that, you know, objects that go, the objects can be pulled with gravitational force or an object that is moving in, in vacuum can continue moving until it's impeded by another force. How are we able to understand, not understand, but, but, but conceptualize, you know, concepts like infinity? Because animals cannot do that. How, we, how are we able to do that? And it's all related to consciousness. And, and you can't find consciousness as a physical entity. This is why they keep trying, you know, they can't start measuring the brain and putting on all these probes and there and say, oh, look, see, he, the, this thing fired here and this signal popped up over there. Look, that must be consciousness. Oh, that's, you know, he's dreaming, you see, that's the dream. Oh, we are able to download the dream now. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it doesn't work like that. It does not work like that. These, these are not part of the observable uh, realm. Anything that you can see, meaning you can apply either physical vision or extend that physical vision or sense perception using instrumentation is part of the observable world, which means anything that is other than that is part of the unseen realm. You're not going to find it using any form of instrumentation. And that includes all these people who set up cameras and try to look for the jinn. It's not going to work. 
Now, how much time do we have? Okay. وأما حقيقة القلب فليس من هذا العالم لكنه من عالم الغيب فهو في هذا العالم غريب وتلك القطعة اللحمية مركبة. So as for the reality of the heart, it is not from this realm. This is what I was elaborating on. Rather, it is from the unseen realm, and in this realm, it is a stranger. It is an alien. So in essence, humanity, the human being is an alien on this planet, in this world. We are not originated from this planet. We have, we have originated from a different realm altogether. Not just a different planet, a different realm altogether. We are not a, an origin species of, of the physical observable universe. We have come in essence from a different realm because the heart itself is not a physical thing. It is from the essence of the angels. And this fleshy organ is just a vessel. And this is why the physical heart will react when the, the spiritual heart um, feels or senses or has a change in state. You know, you feel when there's this inflamed love for someone, for instance, your heart will beat faster. Or when you're suddenly gripped by fear, your heart is going to react to it. When the spiritual heart is diseased, the physical heart is going to get diseased. When the spiritual heart is, is clean and healthy, then the physical heart is also going to be clean and healthy. And that goes also for you know people who have got heart diseases because it's a sign of overconsumption or rather the cause of it, the physical cause of that would be overconsumption. You see, too much consumption of all these foods, especially too much consumption of junk foods, will lead to a problem in the heart, in the physical heart. But what's the ultimate root cause of that? It's a diseased heart. Because a clean heart, spiritual heart, will not go and give in to the concupiscent aspect of the being. Because overconsumption is a concupiscent quality. And a, and a clean heart, inshallah, when we go through the whole thing, you know, you'll understand this better, what, what that means. Um, and, and this is the best descriptive you can give. Instead of saying body parts and whatever, he gives the description of everything else is a soldier or are soldiers or troops to the heart. So you have the heart, and everything else extending from the heart, including now the self and the soul and the intellect and the mind, the brain, organs, senses, everything, are all soldiers. They're all soldiers to the heart. They're troops. And it is their king. And this life is mujahada. It's a struggle. You're here to do jihad. You're here to fight. You're here to have a battle, an epic battle of your being to save your being from damnation. That's, that's the best description I think you could give this. And knowledge of Allah or knowing Allah is and, and His majesty and witnessing His beauty and His majesty is its prime quality. This is what it was designed to do. It was not designed to get affiliated with anything else and therefore getting affiliated with anything else if your heart is associated with other things it is a sign of it being diseased or it being corrupted and this and all the burdens are on the heart. All the burdens. It is the heart that endures them. Even a physical burden, it is the heart that ultimately bears it. Any sort of burden, any taklif, any trial, any tribulation, the ultimate recipient is the heart. And the divine speech from Allah was meant for the heart. 
So if the heart is in a, in a sound state, the divine speech is always with it. And to it, the heart is the, is the reward. And to the heart is the punishment. And felicity and contentment, as well as damnation, they follow it. وَالرُّوحَ الْحَيَوَانِ and the animus spirit, and in the next section, inshallah, he's going to expand more on, on the ruh a little bit. The animal spirit, the animus, what animates or makes it come, al come into a life in the state of living. So if you look at the body, it's just, it's a corpse, right? What you would call a jasad. Um, it's empty and it's hollow. So then... The, the ru'ah, which is min amri rabbi, is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it's from his affair. And he's the one who commands it to do what it needs to do. And each thing, by the way, it's not a universal ru'ah. It's not just one single ru'ah that everything has. Each, each, each thing, each being has been given its own ru'ah. And it's all collectively part of his creation. And, and he's going to expand a little bit on that also because some people, they made the assumption that the Ruach is, is something that's, you know, divine. That it's, then they started and they would even worship it in that sense. Um, but the Ruach is min amri rabbi, it's from, it's from the Amr of Allah. And, and he says in the Quran, Ala lahu al khalq wal amr. To him belong the Amr and the Khalq. So the Amr is also part of his creation. The Khalq is also part of his creation. The Ruah falls under the category of the Amr and the Ruah is hence his creation. Um, and each being has their own designated Ruah. So you have, for example, the Ruah that was breathed into Adam is not the same Ruah that everybody else has. And likewise, the Ruah that was breathed into Nabi Isa is not the same Ruh that others have and this is why the Jews were very um, devious about it when they wanted to sort of trick the Prophet wasallam in asking the question about the Ruh. You see there was, there was something that they were trying to determine here because it goes back into their own, uh, their own history. You see when, when this event transpired and you can, you can read about this in my book, the three questions, I've broken it down into much more detail. The, 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 when, when Nabi Isa was born, the prime question was asked to Maryam, how is this possible when no man has touched you? And so the response was that this was done by Ruh al-Qudus bringing in the divine spirit, the Ruah that animates the, the seed the, 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 that by which Nanshi was able to bear a child. And this is where the confusion started arising between them because as far as their scriptures were concerned, and this is something that they boasted about as well, that, you know, we've been given the Torah and this is not there in the Torah. We have all the knowledge and, and you're just making stuff up now. Uh, they couldn't rationalize this. That how is that even possible? And this is where also they started coming up with this hatred for Jibreel alayhi salam. And it's there even in their texts. They, 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 you know, they, they end up changing a lot of the verses of the Old Testament. They started inserting their own just to sh paint Jibril in negative light. Um, anyway, I, was, I got, where was I? Inshallah, we'll talk about the Ruh a little bit more in the next session, Inshallah. But so the animal spirit in all affairs, in all matters, is with the heart and follows the heart. Because the heart has been given access to the body. And the heart can command the body to go here, to go there, to do all that thing. So the animal spirit, the ruah, enables, is what animates the body in, in doing that. You see, what like myself doing this right now, it's not some blood flow and muscle tension and all these other things that as far as nominal causes are concerned, you can build a whole science out of this, which exists already in explaining, okay, this is what happens. For example, if you ask a doctor, you know, why does Tylenol work? Or why does this medicine work? Or why does that medicine work? They'll give you a whole disposition on, 
on the howness of it. Okay, you take this and then this breaks down and then this does like this and this gets sent here and then it does like that. That's the howness of the physical aspect. But then what's making that howness um, manifest? What's making it do what it's doing? <laughs> you see, because when you when you take the when you when you examine the body, and 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 you can ask this to to any of these scientists, they'll never be able to give an answer. What's powering the body? Where is it? Where is that energy coming from? They'll tell you, oh, it's food and it's drink and it's this and it's that, and you know this gets converted into proteins and that. That's it. That's not it. What's really powering the body? We're not talking about the fuel that's giving that that is giving it its energy, because the fuel that's giving it its energy that's its nutrition. What's giving it its its real power? That's the that's the that's the ruach. You see, so it's always there because the heart is what decides. Okay, I want to I want my hand to do this, and I want my eyes to look there, and I want my mouth to say this. I want my volume to be this much. All these things, these commands that I'm executing in the outward sense are all coming from my heart you see and the anima spirit my spirit is what's making all these functions manifest because the amr is what manifests the khalq and the ruh is from amr and my body is of the khalq wa ma'rifatu haqiqatuhu and Ma'rifa, knowledge and understanding is its reality. Its reality, it was created for just that, nothing else. The heart was only created for two things. To believe and to acquire knowledge. And the two go hand in hand. Because faith without knowledge is ignorance. And knowledge without faith is delusion it's delusion you can have as many degrees as you want to have but if it doesn't take you closer to your creator you're in ghafla <laughs> you're in heedlessness because they've yeah they've acquired the knowledge they know all the sciences but they're lost insofar as their true reality is concerned and that true reality is to affirm belief in one god and to recognize who that God is. And so you need, it has to have this conviction because the heart needs to cling to something. Belief is its natural state. And this is why every creature, every human being will believe in something or the other. In what it believes in, that's what makes it unique or gives it its difference. You can believe in anything. You see, even atheists say, I don't believe in God. Yeah, but you believe in, oh, I believe in science. You know, I, I, I believe that, 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 you know, the stars are, are there and, and I believe in the laws of physics and I believe, you still believe in something. You have to believe. <laughs> That's the nature of the heart is to believe. What you believe in, and this is why in the hadith of Jibreel, the Prophet wasallam does not give a definition of Iman. If you look at the, if you look at the hadith, there's no definition of Islam. And there's no definition of Iman. He defines Ihsan. And he, and he, and he elaborates further on the other question. But Iman, Islam and Iman, he doesn't give a, a, a definition. Because, leave the Islam portion, but that's not our topic. But the Iman portion, it is known what belief is. Because every heart is designed to believe. It's tasdiq. It is conviction. Imam al-Laqani says, in, in, in Jawhar al-Tawheed, وَفُسِّرَ الْإِيمَانُ بِالْتَسْدِيقِ The, the, the heart, the, 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 uh, the, the definition of Iman is tasdiq, it's to have conviction. It's to ratify, to cling to something. That's the nature of the heart, it's clingy. It has to attach to something. And the problem is a lot of people fall into depression and anxiety when the heart realizes that it's been betrayed by the thing it was clinging to. You see, they eat bigger when you, when you, so for example, you get attached to someone, you get attached to your spouse, you see, and then your spouse passes away, it hits you hard. The heart was clinging on to somebody and then that somebody is now no longer there. Now that's not a blameworthy cling, it's a praiseworthy cling, but the heart still feels it and it puts it in a state of depression. 
And this is why the ultimate thing that you can cling to is something that's absolute, that won't change, that is not going to differ, that's not going to leave you, it's not going to betray you. And that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because He is the only real and absolute. And this is why the heart is always looking for the truth, is looking for al-haq, is looking for a haqiqa. But most people are stuck on the causal level. They are, they are only, they, and then they end up clinging onto material things. But guess what? The material thing disappears. It perishes. It breaks. It goes away. It gets stolen. Then what? Then you're in a state of depression. <laughs> and the other thing is knowledge. Because belief has to go with truth. This is an epistemological question. And this is fundamentally the, the, the most, uh, it's the most fundamental question or fundamental problem in the field of epistemology. How do we know what we know? And how do we know that what we know is the truth? So that our belief in the truth can be justified. Because you have to believe in the truth. So your belief in the truth can be, can be justified. Because if you just believe in something to be true, does it inherently become true? If I believe that unicorns exist, does it become an absolute truth that unicorns exist? How do you know? The, the path of knowing, and it's not just about, you know, the, the knowledge knowing. You can read the sharh or the matin or the, the commentaries and the science. You can go through years and years, but it's not that kind of knowing. It's not ilm. Ilm is only a step, it's a bridge. The ilm will take you now to ma'rifah. And that's the word he's using here. Where is it? Wa ma'rifatu haqiqatuhu. Ma'rifah is its reality. It, it wants to reach ma'rifah. Because once he is now, once the heart is now in a state of, 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 of ma'rifah, its belief is ratified and, 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 and is solidified. It knows that it is clinging to an absolute truth, not a truth that is shaky in its foundations. And this is why I always advise everyone, all my students, don't get hung up on semantics. Don't get hung up on particularities. Avoid the field of semantical analysis, politics, uh, argumentation, debates, these kinds of things, they will keep you on this agent, on this level of agent intellection. And it will put you in a state of turbulence, constant turbulence. You will be constantly trying to, 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 to figure something out because you're desperate now to cling to something. You see? All these, all these people, especially those who are now also in the, in the, in the range, in the, in the field of conspiracy theories, why are they always stuck there? Their mind is gripped because the intellect loves that. It loves symbols. The intellect was designed to interpret symbols. So you give symbols to the intellect, oh, it's, 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 it's Eid for the intellect. But the heart was not designed for that. It was not designed for all that. The heart was designed for universal understanding. And this is why if you look at the Quran and he says it, he said it earlier, Mm, where did he say it? Wal khitab, yes, in the same paragraph. Wal khitab ma'ahu. The divine speech is with it, with the heart. The Quran, the language of the Quran speaks the language of the heart. The Quran speaks in universals. It, it speaks in absolute truths. It is not a book of facts. It's not a book of science. It's not a book of mathematics and numbers. And all these people doing their calculations, look, if you do this and you look at this ayah, it has got this many letters. And if you do this plus this plus that plus that, you see now a divine miracle. See, the Quran has got numerical miracles. It's not. That's stupidity. You are being stupid when you do that. I'm sorry to say it. The Quran was not sent as a book of numbers to you. It's got its own metric. It's got its own aesthetics. And this is by design. But that's not its primus. That's its embellishment. Its primus is the language and the meanings because that's what the heart comprehends. And the things that the Quran speaks about speaks on a level of fitrah. This is why you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses a language and this is where all these flat earth idiots come out 
and they start taking out these ayat and they say, look, the Quran says the earth is flat. Look, look, the haha, look, the haha means this. It's flat. Look, the Quran says the sun was setting in a murky pond. Look, see, it's not talking about scientific facts. It's not talking about what your instrumentation can derive about the cosmos. It is speaking to you from a fitra perspective because it is fitra to see the sun rising. Fitra does not see the earth turning. Even though reason will, will enable you to arrive at that truth, which is a factual truth, that the earth is turning. But fitra is what sees the earth, the sun rising. And that's why the Quran speaks from that perspective. Fitra sees the landscape even. Anyway, those are, I don't want to get into all that stuff. But my point is that the Quran, the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was designed for the heart. It was not designed for the aql or for the, for the brain or for your science textbooks or for you to go and start seeing and pulling out these ayat and saying, oh look, the Quran talked about Big Bang Theory 1400 years ago. Yeah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and told him about the Big Bang Theory. This is the stupidity with which people go into the Quran and start drawing out all this stupid nonsense. The Quran is not talking about Big Bang Theory. The Quran is not talking about all these other things. The Quran is speaking about reality. It is giving you a direct understanding of what reality is. And then it is imploring you to use your intellect. Afala yaqilun. Will they not reason? Reason in the right way. So that what you receive from divine revelation that comes into the heart and what you experience now from your external sense perception is in harmony. This is Majma al Bahrain. This is where the two oceans of knowledge meet. And then you have soundness or sound epistemology within yourself. Anyway, I'm, I'm going off on a rant. I'm sorry. Wa ma'rifatu sifatuhu and ma'rifa is its quality. Miftahu ma'rifatu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the key to knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is nothing else that will take you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or to, 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 to knowing him. فَعَلَيْكَ بِالْمُجَاهَدَةَ حَتَّى تَعْرِفَهُ So upon you is the struggle and the strive until you come to know it, to know the heart, to understand it. لِأَنَّهُ جَوْهَرٌ عَزِيزٌ مِنْ جِنْسِ جَوْهَرِ الْمَلَائِكَةِ Because it is a, a majestic essence. It, it, it is a precious essence from the, from the genus of the angelic essence. The essence with which the angels were created is the same essence with, from which the heart was created. وَأَسْلُ مَعَدِنِهِ مِنْ حَضْرَةِ الْإِلَهِيَةِ It is from the, from the origin, its origin is from the divine presence. That's when he asked the question, أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ That's the first thing he asked you. The first acknowledgement of your existence and his existence was this question. Bala shahidna was the answer, was the response from everyone. It is from that, its origin is from the divine presence. Min dhalika al-makan jaa, from that place did it come. Wa ila dhalika makan, wa ila dhalika al-makan yahud. And to that destination it will return. I think we should stop here. Sorry. Um, oh yes, yes, yes. There was, um, but do we have time right now? It's, yeah, we, we have actually crossed our time. We'll have to do it next week, inshallah. Okay, so we'll do it next. Yeah, let's stop here, inshallah, because I, we're going to end up taking up too much time. And uh, there was something else that I wanted to also share with you. So, um, inshallah, I'll do that next week. Uh, as well as the next section. Now, Alhamdulillah, Jazakallah Khairan. Let's take a quick break. And uh, because I want to stretch my legs and I want to drink my chai has become cold now. <laughs> so let's take a quick break. Inshallah, we'll meet back in uh, five, maybe 10 minutes. Jazakallah Khairan. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalatu wassalamu ala ashraf al-Anbiya wa al-Mursaleen. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Now, let's, uh, questions, answers, uh, comments, thoughts. Now, yes, go ahead. Now, Bismillah. 
Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. You will uh, forgive me, I have uh, more than two questions. Mm -hmm. It's okay. But they're all related to the, to the past. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found a lot of things that you said very, very uh, interesting. Um, one of them is, uh, the first one is, uh, the issue of um, sudden death. Mm -hmm. There's there's a there's there's um, a prophetic saying where the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he talked about um, one of the signs of the end times would be sudden death. Could we say or do you think that the sudden death it, it, it uh, you know that actually came to my mind when you were talking about um, the cult and the rule and I thought if there's a connection between this sudden death and uh you know in surah abrad i've forgotten the verse where god said only in the tranquility will will hearts find rest mm -hmm. where it's a alizina amanu tatmainu kulubuhum to the krela yes yeah so yes so could we say that the heart not being in that state of tranquility, you know, being one of the reasons of that sudden death? And if it is, is that also a connection between the heart not being in that state of tranquility and what we see as depression that leads to suicide? Um, as, as far as the, the prophecy of, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it was, sudden death has always been there for humanity. The, the prophecy is related to um, an increase in the number of sudden deaths. Like it, it becomes pronounced. So you have people dying in war, you have people dying in, I mean, you've got this whole industrial age that's part of the eschatology that um, can cause all these sudden deaths. Uh, and, and, and some of them are forgivable. Like, you know, like the, all these people, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them uh, Jannah, who, you know, passed away in this uh, recent earthquake in, in, in Turkey and Syria. The, these, these would be, you know, they're, they're, they're considered to be martyrs because the, the death itself was not by their own doing. Um, and it, they, they, have, they were taken by an external uh, force. If somebody is shot, for example, uh, and they die on the on the spot. That's th that, that person is considered to be a martyr. Now, the other aspect of it is the soundness of the heart. So each individual has been given a, a certain duration of longevity. And we don't know, no one knows how long each individual has got. So, I mean, even those people who are, let's say, like in the earthquake, they're people who actually still survived, you know. They, they survived for... for I, I read a story about a woman who, um, who, was, who, who was survived, I think, for four days or five days. And um, there was water trickling down through some of the passageways and falling right on, onto her lips. And that kept her nourished <laughs> for, until they found her. I mean, these are people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not yet declared death for them. Um, and yet for others... So even though there was this external factor that contributed, I mean, the chances of dying suddenly without any warning or anything is high, Allah can still prolong somebody's uh, longevity. As far as tatma'innu al-qulub, um, in the ayah, ala bi dhikrillahi tatma'innu al-qulub, it's referring to soundness of the heart, the aman, and um, we're going to talk about this, inshallah. There is a slide that I've also made. When we come to that section, you will see where the aman falls. Uh, it's the heart that is turbulating that requires or needs some sort of stillness. And iman is what gives it its stillness. And that's why in, in the Arabic, the root is the same of aman. Uh, the, it's the heart that wants to believe is sincere in its pursuit of belief and only by belief 
will it find soundness or, or will it find stillness? And so that's what the ayah in Surah Turab says, and, and there's another ayah also elsewhere, that it is only by the remembrance of God, by, by remembering God, because that's the inclination of the heart. The heart was designed only to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and only through that can the heart find uh, tranquility. I'm not sure if I answered that question. There was, there was, another, there was another thing that you had mentioned there. I, I forgot. Um. Oh, I asked if uh, the Tatma'in al Kulub also has something to do with the depression that leads to suicide. Yes, it can. Because here's the thing, the human being, see, ultimately you're looking for something. And, and a lot of people are always looking for something. But life has got what you would call darajat and then darakat. So every human being starts off on, on, a, on, a, on a neutral playing field. And then you climb up the steps towards ascension. And this is what you would call the spiritual ascension of man. And then, or you go down the steps, darakat. You find this variance in Surah An-Nur. You've got the ayah, ayah, ayah of Nur, which gives you the hierarchy. There is the Mishkat, and then there is the, there is the Misbah, and then there is a Zujaja, and then there is uh, Zaytun, the, the olive and the purity of the olive tree. These are all symbol, symbolic. And then you've got Nur, right? So that's the spiritual ascension. And we'll talk about this later also, inshallah. I've got another chart that elaborates all these things. And then you've got the ayah of darkness. And so in the hierarchy of darkness, you've got first, you've got the, in, 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 in Surah to Nur also, there is the cloud, there's a thick cloud, and then there is a wave, and then another wave, and then there is the sea, and then there is the depth of the sea, the fathomless darkness of the sea. So in one direction, you're going towards light. In another direction, you're going towards darkness. But each of those has a step. So for the human being, it begins with the outward step, and then it goes towards the inward step. The foremost outward step is religion. It's the deen. So the first outward step is acceptance of the deen. That's why the shahada is the first pillar of Islam. And then you've got the Salat, and then the Zakat, and then the, 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 the Saum, and then the Hajj. And then you've got other steps that come after that. So on a neutral level, every human being is in this dunyawi aspect of existence. Everyone is a horizontal, right? People are, are on this horizontal plane, and then they got, get caught up on the horizontal plane, they never are able to take the first step to ascension. And the heart comes from that spiritual domain. It's not of this worldly domain. So long as it is in this worldly domain, anything it clings to, insofar as the worldly domain is concerned, will betray it. That's why people, like they'll have a job and then they lose their job, they're in depression or they'll have some property or something and then disaster will come and wipe out their property and then they're in depression. And those are bigger things, but you also have the minor things, the smaller things that happen in life that keep causing this, you know, you cling to it and then you get, you lose it and you're depressed. So the tatma'in al-qulub, ultimately the highest of it is remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you have to remember your, how you, you, your testimony that He is your Lord. Allah to be Rabbikum, the raja'ah of the human being, the return of the human being is to return to that state. We'll talk about the intellect as well, inshallah. Imam Al Ghazali explains the four levels of intelligence, of the intellect. And then there is a fifth level which returns the human being back to his original state, of fitrah. In the fitra state is where you find your true contentment. Which he also says later on that everything finds its contentment in the nature of what it was created for, in the purpose of its creation. So, it is, and this is why what he, this is his understanding of fitra, how he came to understand that it's fitra, going back to a state of fitra is what makes a person now realize their true nature. And that's where they find their contentment. And that's, that contentment is what gives the heart its tranquility. That's tatma in al-qulub. 
because the nature of the human being, fitra, is to remember Allah. Right? You were not created but to serve Him, but to know Him. Illa li'arifun, but to know Him, and 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 hence to remember Him. Um, now, mm -hmm. and uh, please just the last one, please. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned something about uh, unseen that anything we don't see belongs to the realm of the unseen. Mm -hmm. So we have things that you know. Uh, you know, you talked about being able to use a thousand, you know, thousands of years ago, there were some things that we weren't able to see that we can now use instruments to see. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, can we say that the unseen mm -hmm. or some aspects of the unseen is relative with respect to time? No. Could you do this? This thing, yeah. There are a lot of aspects that are related to time that, that you we really cannot even begin to comprehend because first and foremost it's important to distinguish between time and eternity time and eternity are not the same thing because when people start thinking about eternity they think that eternity is essentially a lot of time time is related to a physical domain it's only related to a physical, material, or a seen domain. Now that does not mean that because there are certain things you can't see, they exist outside of time. For instance, as far as the human being is concerned, our field of vision, what our eyes can see, is a certain range. Uh, on the electromagnetic spectrum, we only have a certain range of what's called visible light. And then there are certain things that we can't see on this side and some things on that side, right? So X-rays, gamma rays, and all that we can't see on this side. And then you've got infrared and then television, radio waves, we can't see on this side. Same case goes for hearing. So we'll talk about the veils later on. The human being is veiled. There are multiple veils that prevent the human being from seeing, ultimately seeing without the veils. The first veil is the veil of the senses, and then there is the veil of the brain, and then there is the veil of the sadr. There is a veil that is between the, the physical body, the, the biological body, and then the soul. There is the veil of the sadr, and then there is the veil of the intellect. And then there, is, there are multiple veils that prevent multiple sorts of seeing. So. The senses are limited in their perception, but you can amplify their range of vision using instruments. The same thing goes for the ears. And then, as far as, let's say, your sense of touch is concerned, you can, you can touch, let's say, a physical object, like a, a, a full, any, any object, you can touch that, but you can't touch the atom, which is strange. Like, you can't actually touch and feel an atom in the air. So, that sense can be amplified using a different kind of instrument. The more instruments that they develop increases the range of sensory perception, but it's still part of the physical domain. Why? Because the instrument itself is material. Right? The instrument itself is made of matter. <laughs> any instrument you want to pick, any if it's a camera or whatever it is, it's made of it's made of matter. Whether it uses electromagnetic forces or fields or electricity or, or, or magnetic energy or whatever it uses is still part of the physical domain. This is what, if you want to look at Einstein's equation, E is equal to mc squared, it pertains physicality. Energy is mass by the constant of the velocity of light squared. So mass and energy are directly proportional so long as the speed of light is constant. And so anything that has mass has got energy. Anything that has energy has got a mass. So energy and mass or matter itself is part of the physical domain. So then comes the question, okay, so why can't we see the jinn? <laughs> Are they part of the unseen? Yeah, insofar as sensory perception goes, they're part of the unseen. But insofar as physicality goes, they're not part of the unseen. And the Quran verifies that, that they cannot come close to the first heaven. They're still in this world, but they are, there's another veil between us and them. So there are multiple veils between human perception and 
and other entities. There are many things like biological, microbiological organisms that you can't see with your naked eye. You need instrumentation for that. And I'm, there's people who have developed like, you know, all these high sensitive cameras and they've seen certain, you know, energies. They've been able to detect certain energies within the physical space, which would only indicate that there is a presence of something else there, which we would know as the jinn, uh, but it's still being done through instrumentation. And so it is part of alam al al shahada. In the next section, inshallah, he's going to explore, expand more on alam al shahada. He's going to give you three distinct qualities by which you can understand the physical observable realm. We'll talk about that, inshallah, next session. Thank you so much. No. Mm -hmm. Who is that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question, actually, because a lot of people end up in that in that state. Um, the thing is, you have to remember that love is something that that has a bond on the heart in in one aspect, and then has a different kind of bond bond on the self. So there is the love that the self experiences, and then there is the love that the heart experiences. Now, if somebody is somebody like if you lose somebody very close to you, incredibly close to you, not necessarily a spouse, but you know, your father or your mother, your grandfather, your brother, sibling, anyone, even a friend, the love that you have for a created thing should not surpass the love that you should have for the creator himself. If, if this is the love for a created thing, then what about love for the creator himself? And, and there's a section in the text also, he's, we're going to come across that again later on. Um, like for, he gives an example of, you know, somebody who meets the wazir, he's happy. And then he meets the king and he just forgets about the wazir, <laughs> right? So you have this love for your spouse or for your family, for somebody within you, within close proximity of you, and, and, and the love and the bond is strong, so that when it breaks, it really shatters you. Ultimately, the heart must recognize the love of the Creator above that love. And this is where, Allah bi dhikri lahi tatma'in al By the remembrance of, the heart, of, of, of Allah, are the hearts kept sound. Because somebody who then ends up into a state of a suicidal state or, or a state of insanity, that person did not have a sound heart to begin with. And that's just the unfortunate thing about it. Well, yeah, because of guilt, other things, a lot of things will affect, yeah. A lot of things will affect an individual. Somebody will actually start feeling the guilt of, oh, you know, I should have given them more attention, I shouldn't have said this, I shouldn't have done that. People do feel that, yeah. Somebody could have enmity with somebody else in the family, and then they suddenly pass away, and then, you know, you're hit with this, with this guilt as, I, I wasted, you know, I should have asked for forgiveness. I should never have done what I did, or put them through what, what I put them through. That guilt can affect you. But a lot of other factors will also affect you. Blame worthy uh, factors. Not just the love of it. If you truly love the other person, then your love for the creator of that other person will supersede that person. Because the, the, the heart, you will find a way of, of keeping it tranquil with faith that that person may have left you, but has gone to their creator. And if you truly love them, then you will be happy for that. Because there is nothing more praiseworthy in existence than to be in the Divine Presence. And to return to the Divine Presence is nothing more praiseworthy in existence. So if somebody actually passes away and you know that they've gone to their Creator, then you would be more happy for that than your loss. And that keeps you sane. But if you are unhappy for that loss, or why did God, you know people do that. Why did, why did he have to die? You know, God is merciless and he just killed this, killed my, my spouse or, you know, why, why, why did you have to take, why, you see people crying on the, on, you know, 
on the graves. Why did he have to live like that? That sort of attitude is a selfish attitude. Oh, God has robbed me. God has taken away my loved one. God is, you see, that's a selfish attribute. That's a sign of a diseased heart. People who sit and start crying and wailing when somebody passes away, that's a diseased heart. There are a lot of symptoms because the diseases of the soul and the diseases of the heart, those are more expansive than the diseases of the body. There are incredible number of symptoms that you can find in people and, and recognize that they need to work on themselves. <laughs> And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's also going to say that later on, Ghazali will mention this in one aspect, that if he gives you this tribulation, he, has, he, has, he wants you to succeed. Because that tribulation, any trial that afflicts an individual is meant to cleanse them. That's what fitna is, right? Fitna, one of the meanings of the word fitna is to purify gold, um, to cleanse it from, from, from impurities. To smelt, when you smelt gold, when you smelt the metal, then you start removing what's, you know, what the layer that forms on top of it, you remove the impurities. That's what fitna is. It cleanses you of impurities. So when, uh, when a fitna like that happens, when a trial or tribulation like that happens, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen for you an opportunity to cleanse yourself. Because when you start demonstrating those qualities, you start making all this noise, and all this drama and crying and wailing and why go why this why that that's a sign that you need to work on yourself <laughs> because you're now seeing your true reality you see, your own diseases are coming out but uh, those who don't take heed of that then the disease prolongs their hearts are disease Allah increases their disease and that disease ultimately manifests in insanity and then they destroy themselves because then they go into their own deliberations you see we're going to talk about that also inshallah their own thoughts and deliberations and, and they start plotting and planning in themselves um, he says in, in in Surah Al-Muddathir uh, innahu, innahu fakkara wa qaddara fakutila kayfa qaddara See how he thinks and he deliberated? And then look how he destroyed himself by his own deliberations. And then further than that, he destroyed himself over and over again by his own deliberations. You see, the mind then takes its own volition. And whenever the mind, the aql takes its own volition, again, it's a sign that the heart is weak. We'll come to the hierarchy of governance, of internal governance. Who is in charge? Who is in charge within yourself? Is it your concupiscence? Is it your irascibility? Is it your intellect? Is it your mind? You see, they say mind is power. Mind is not power. That's their philosophy. And that's why they are the kind of people they are. The Western world, the secular world. Mind is not power. Who is in charge within you? And, and if your volitions are manifesting in these other mannerisms, it's a clear sign that you're not in charge of yourself. You're not in charge of your volitions. You're not in charge of your mental prowess. And that's why you are suffering the things that you're suffering. Anyway, long, long answer to, to that question. But it's a very good question. And I know a lot of people actually go through this. They, they end up, you know, in these states. And it's a sign for them to work on themselves. Because no one can save you from that moment but yourself. Really, no one can save you. It, the only person you can turn to is your creator. You, if you become like Iblis and start blaming this one and that one and that one, that's what Iblis did and that was his downfall. You're the one who led me astray. You're the one who caused me this, this problem. You're the one who put me in this state. The, he's the only one you can rely on and then you start blaming him. You're going to destroy yourself. Anyway, now go ahead, uh, Roshan. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. MashaAllah, this should be a prerequisite for all the courses you're going to teach us. Because really, we need this one before we can understand um, other topics. Uh, uh, I have written a few lines here regarding what you posted today. I don't know if it's true, you can correct me. Um, I wrote, the spiritual heart is a, is a key to understanding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the tranquility of the heart is in the remembrance of Allah and 
the greatest of the remembrance of Allah is the love of Allah. Mm -hmm. And the love of Allah will increase or bring taqwa of Allah in our heart. I wrote these lines and there is one aspect that uh, I think is missing in it. Um, and I will read the ayah from the Quran that's connected to what I wrote. Allah says, Speaking of Rasulullah, so we have to follow him. And then Allah says, No, you're absolutely right. No, no, you're you are absolutely right. Because when he gave you, and in any way he gives anybody anything, he's giving it as a blessing, right? That's a ni'mah from Allah. When he takes it away, he he's 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 testing your your faith, and and the and the test in that faith is the test of shukr. Shukr is the thing that's being tested. He wants to see, were you thankful for what he gave you? Or did he just take it and you were happy while it was there? And then when he takes it away, now you're upset. Because a true believer will say, Alhamdulillah, regardless of the circumstance. Whether it's a praiseworthy circumstance or a blameworthy one. And you know, the circumstantial aspect of it doesn't, doesn't affect them. And this is where the heart becomes sound because the circumstance doesn't affect them. You know that I, I, I gave this uh, story in a lecture about, about the farmer and uh, I, put this, the, the, I put the parable in my other book, The Crucible of Abstinence. The farmer who had a son and he loved the boy and his only intention was this boy should not be parted from him. And then they, they, they came and his wife had passed away so he, he's only, you know, uh, he, he had clung to the boy. And that was his intention. And then they, they got some money and uh, they bought a horse. 
and the villagers they praised him and they said you know what a bounty and he said maybe maybe it's a bounty maybe it's not and then they would use that horse to cart you know uh, transfer goods and help people out bring things to the marketplace but then the burden was too much on the horse and the horse passed away so the villagers came and said oh what a tragedy so the man said maybe and then when he went he was burying the horse in the in the woods he came upon a whole herd of wild horses and he brought them back so the villagers said what a bounty he said maybe now because the boy was attached to the horse that passed away he decided to take one of those wild horses and and train them but then the wild horse you know threw him off and he fell and he broke his leg villagers came and said what a tragedy he said maybe so while the boy was there recovering from his injuries the emperor sent his his agents his recruiters they're coming to recruit young boys to join the military the army and go for war so they take all the boys in the village and when they come upon this boy they see he's broken his leg he's useless can't fight in the war so they leave him <laughs> and then they go and the villagers come back and they say what a bounty <laughs> what a blessing again the man the man says maybe now if you look at the chain of circumstances that take place in that parable you know what was assumed to be a bounty turned into a tragedy but then that same tragedy turned into a bounty and then that same bounty turned into a tragedy and that's the norm of life there's always this up and down taking place this is why the circumstances keep changing for everyone you see so at one point you have then you don't have allah takes it away then he, he gives it back to you and then he takes it away there's a reason why he puts you through all that is to determine whether you are actually sound so the man was actually sound in his conviction because he had faith that whatever transpires will ultimately transpire for the good and his and his intention was not to be parted from his son that was the real bounty so everything else was just circumstantial because ultimately when the military came to take away his son from him they couldn't and the boy was not parted from his father even though he lost his leg yes a tragedy but you still have the son is still alive your son is still alive <laughs> right that's the nature of life and the idea is to is to cultivate your iman is to be thankful is shukr because kufr the theological definition of kufr is to be an ingrate to be ungrateful of the mercy and the blessing of your lord that's a that's a kafir theological definition so a, a mu'min is somebody who has shukr so regardless of what your circumstance is alhamdulillah and by just doing that you see that's part of your submission to allah he's taken it away all all these people may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them quick recovery and 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 replenish their loss um but all these people who've lost their homes all their property everything everything literally everything they 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 within within a snap a moment of difference they were asleep they didn't even they went to sleep thinking everything will be fine tomorrow i'm going to do this i'm going to do this i'm going to do the abcd everything and then just like that overnight everything is gone literally everything is gone their 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 uh, their possessions everything of sentimental value whatever money they may have had in their homes everything is gone and many of them lost even their family you know think about something like that what 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 is keep look at some of the and and the western media has done a very good job of concealing all that only showing the tragedy it's a very amazing cnn is just looking at the politics between putin and erdogan <laughs> they're not actually looking at what's really transpiring on the ground and and what these people are really look at the smiles on their faces even the children look at look at how the children are they're just smiling you know subhanallah everything you just lost everything the western world is not going to acknowledge that but you've lost everything and look at how grateful these people are just that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has saved them from the tragedy 
Even though everything is gone. You know, that's a mu'min. That's a believer. I mean, now, go, go ahead, um, Mujahid. Assalamu alaikum. Well, alaykum wa rahmatullah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I had my question written on the chat, which I'll bring up, just to help me. Um, so I have two related mm -hmm. questions. Go ahead. First, it's more to do with the Arabic language. You were speaking about uh, the three-letter uh, root words. Mm -hmm. So, do the three-letter root word patterns in Arabic have a primary word which other words are created from? For example, uh, uh, using nafasa. So, nafasa means he breathed, he breathed or it breathed. Nafs is a soul. Nafa wa, the wa is he shook. Mm -hmm. Nafatha is he exhaled. Mm -hmm. So which of these words is the primary word, if there is a primary word, uh, which the others are created from, and how do we identify the primary word? Is it the one with the in the fitter form? So <laughs> nuts is in that fitter form. It's uh, it's, so, it's, know, it's it's very it's interesting. You're so. you are asking that question because this is an age-old debate in uh, in Arabic really? linguistics. Age-old debate. Where, where, which comes first? Is it the fi'l or the ism? <laughs> uh, so you had, we had two, two primary schools uh, that, that are still there, the Kufi school and the Basri school. And you know, one says that the ism came before, the noun comes before the verb. No, the action comes and the action is what denotes what the object will be. So this debate has been, uh, has been it's an age old chicken, chicken or egg question, yeah. yeah. But in essence, in Arabic, the, the Arabic words, they, they the, before they're given their haraka, they are just phonemes. So it's just the n, f, and the s, right? So from those three phonemes is where the derivatives take place. So what the grammarians did was to essentially put them in different categories. So you have different bab, al bab. So you've got the fathu fati, fathu kasri, fathu dhammi, dhammu dhammi. You've got different um, groups. So a set of words in one group will have some similar meanings. And then some of those words will have similarly related meanings to the other groups, but they will be distinct groups. Um, so like the nafs, if you're talking about the nafs, then from that you can take the nafasa, nafisa, nafusa, nafasa, and some of those related meanings. And then you've got now a different group where you've got the nafatha, and then the nafakha group, and then the nafaha group. So you'll find that they have complementary meanings. And these meanings are not planar, like they're not on the same level. It's sort of hierarchical. So you'll find like one word here um, has got no, if you plot it on say a chart, you'll find that this word here has got no direct link to this word here, but they complement each other. So like nafakha and nafasa, they will have stemmed from two different branches. So the nafasa root word will have its own branch and then the nafakha root word will have its own branch and there's no link between the two, but then they complement each other. It's very, compli it's very compli uh, complicated. The science of sarf, the, the, the science, ulmu sarf is the most complicated science in linguistics, in, in all languages, not just Arabic. In fact, in Arabic it's much more complicated than in the other languages. But sarf is the most complicated, it's very difficult. And, and uh, you can make a lot of errors, especially with the, with the Quran's etymology. Um, like you could end up taking a meaning of a certain root word, and that's not really the meaning that's conveyed in the ayah. And then, and, and you'll find that the derivative of that must, might actually end up coming from a completely different root word entirely. I'll give you an example. The, the ayah that a lot of people as with Nabi Isa alayhi salam, the ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Isa, Ya Isa, inni mutawafiq wa rafiuka ilay. The, the word mutawafiq, <laughs> see a lot of people have made that mistake to conclude by saying that, that Isa alayhi salam died when he was on the cross. Because you've got two root words there. You've got wafa, which is wafa, and then the ya maksura, and then you've got another root word, which is, which is comes from a from a quadrilateral root system, which is ta wafa. There's a ta wow, and then fa, and then <laughs> ya maksura. That's a different root word altogether. So even 
And in the Arabic language, not all root words are trilateral. They are quadrilateral. There are um, five letter root words. There are six letter root words as well. So you have to be kind of careful with the root word systems and etymology in Arabic. Um, you said you had two questions. What's the what's the other one? I can't I can't it's see the chat box. So. Mm -hmm. so, go ahead. Um, there was a question is, is there a connection between the words room, room and rooms? Room, sorry, come again, Ru? So, ru, uh, room, with the meme at the end, uh -huh. and rus with the scene at the end. Rus, okay, so, no, yeah, there's no connection between those three. That's that exactly what I just explained right now. So, Ruah is the spirit, like we said. Room is a name. It's, it's a derived form. It's not a root word. Room is a name. It's, it is, and it's a name that is... A, so is it's, it a, a non-Arabic word? Is that what yeah, is? yeah. It is, it is Ajami. Yeah. It's Ajami. It's a derived... It is a derived... Uh, sort of a, like a transliteration. So the, the Romans now. So you had... At that time you had the, the, the Western Roman Empire and then you had the Eastern Roman Empire which was also known as the Byzantine Roman Empire. So those were called Rum. And then you have Rus is the Russians. Um, so the, the, actually the original, Russian is an English word, Russian. The, the, the etymology of that is Rus. The, the people themselves in their origin, in their language, are called the Rus. So that's again, it's a borrowed word. It's not a root word. It's what that thing is called. That's the same letters, those same phonemes. In my language, I will call that thing with the same um, phonemes. Like, like in, in my mother tongue, typically we will use English words to denote things that don't have an origin in my own mother tongue. So for example, tea is called chai in my mother tongue, chai. And, and chai is a Swahili word. That same Swahili word is derived from the Arabic chai. And I think in Hindi or Urdu also it is called chai. <laughs> so the derivative of that word is for my mother tongue, which is kach or kachi, it derives its root word, it derives its words from Arabic as well as from Urdu and Farsi and, and a little bit of Indian Gujarati from different sources. But in my tongue, that root word doesn't exist. So rather than make up a word in my language to denote what it is, I will just take the word as it exists in the other language and use that. That's Rus now. So because the phonemes are accommodated in the language, there is no need to make another root word and there is no conflict. This doesn't conflict with any other word in the language. So the same derivative of Rus, you can have Rawasa, for example or Ruisa, which have their own meanings. But Rus has its own meaning as the Russians. There's no correlation between them, between that and the Ruwa. Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, so, uh, I, had a question, I had two questions actually. The first one uh, is um, regarding these uh, levels in which we um, try to gain Ma'arif of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the first being uh, through actions or righteous actions or uh, acts of worship. So, is that, uh, is that an easier part? For example, if we do something, uh, some good deed or some act of worship, it leads to another and you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he brings us closer to himself. Mm -hmm. But this path that now we are taking, it seems a very a difficult path, you know, it's not that easy. So it's like you take two steps forward or one step forward and you push two steps behind. It's almost like, you know, humiliation. I mean, if you get what I mean, I mean, I don't mean humility, mm -hmm. I mean humiliation. So am I going um, on the right path or is this... Um, well, is, is this part so difficult? It's, it's not difficult per se, but it is the harder of the two. So there are two paths. I think I mentioned last week the path of salvation, the path of, of sanctification, right? So he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, 
ألم نجعل له عينين ولسانا وشفتين وهديناه النجدين فلقتهم العقبة فكوا رقبة He's given you two eyes, he's given you a tongue and two lips and then he's shown you two pathways. So what will make you realize but he has not taken the steep path, the more difficult path. See, he wants you to take the difficult path, not to humiliate you. It's not to, no, it's not to make you feel, oh, because it's beyond your capabilities. See, for Iblis, I'll give you, an exa- I'll give you that example. For Iblis, the difficult path was to, was to prostrate. It was a difficult thing for him to do. It was incredibly hard for him to actually do that because it entailed going against everything he thought he knew. And it entailed swallowing his own pride and really you know, suppressing his self to obey that command. And he failed. That's a very difficult thing to do. And the humiliation that you will feel is not really humiliation. It is a defense mechanism of the self. The self is actuating a defense mechanism. You know, like how somebody, like you'll be sitting in a gathering, for instance, and then you, you, you behave in a certain way without really thinking. And then maybe your, your parent or your grand, grandparent just tells you off in front of everyone. See, you, get, you start feeling this rage and this anger. You know, did they have to tell me like that in front of everyone? You feel this hatred towards them. Your ears go red, you know. You feel, you feel embarrassed, you feel humiliated, but it's, it's the humiliation of the self. You see, that's a good humiliation <laughs> because it leads you to recognize where you went wrong once you overcome yourself and then you, you actually become a better person from them. That's, the, that, that's a steep path. That's a difficult path. It's enough for you to do the, the, the basics. Right? You know, you want to, you're praying, you're fasting, you're performing the rites and the rituals to the letter. And that's the path of salvation. It's enough for you to do that. Amr bil ma'roof, nahiyan al munkar. You see, the one, and then the one who saves himself from the fire and enters his Jannah, he succeeded. Fakal faz. So it's enough for you to do that. But don't you want to take the, the steeper path, the more difficult one, to, 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 to a higher level of success? Don't you want to get that maqam? Or is that not worth it <laughs> to the satisfaction of the self? In other words, in exchange of satisfying the self and preventing embarrassment uh, or that humiliation, you know, would you rather just leave that path altogether? Or would you rather seek out a means by which you can achieve that? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always give guidance to someone who is sincere in seeking that path. I mean, that, that was the character of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I would say in all of, of, of Muslim history, is the most humiliated person in our entire tradition. No one has been humiliated worse than him. No one. No, let me ask you a question. How, how many people have, have come outside your home and, and, and left, uh, and left you know, dirt, uh, filth and, and feces outside your doorstep? How many, how many can say that my uncle has done that to me? How many can do that? Huh? How many can stand up and say that, you know, because of what you believed in, your entire village or your entire town, your entire community has excommunicated you. How many can do that? The Prophet wasallam suffered incredible humiliation. And, and guess what? His is the name that is remembered. Not all those people who did the torture and the embarrassment and the humiliation. So don't, don't let yourself feel humiliated in that aspect that, I mean, even if you're not understanding, let's say, you're not understanding the, 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 the rationality of it, the, 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 the technical terms or the mannerisms or all these things, you know, if they're just floating over your head, don't, don't be disheartened by that. Don't let that make you feel like it's, this is not for me. You, you, if, so long as you're sincere and so long as you maintain the effort, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open the door for you. He will open, Allahumma fta'a ilayna hikmatak, wa anshura alayna rahmatak. That's, that's my dua whenever I start any talk, any lecture. 
And every book that I write, that's my first, that's my dua. Allahumma iftah ilayna hikmatak. Ya Allah, open up the doors or open unto us the doors of hikmah. Now, I, I hope that that will help you. Don't, don't let that feel. If you have taken this path, and Ghazali actually talks about this later on. He says later on, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts this in your pathway, then know that he has chosen for you success. So don't back away from that. Let the self be humiliated. Because it is only from a, from a maqam of humility that the human being can rise. Once you're rock bottom, the only direction is up. And, 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 and the truth will come to you when you are humble, not when you are, when you are prideful. So if you feel humiliated because it's difficult, because you try to do it, you try to perform a certain action, to perform a certain deed, and then you fail at it, that humiliation is a humiliation of the self, and that's a good sign. That's not a negative sign. It's not a sign for you to give up on it. It is a sign for you to keep at it. Because the more you humiliate yourself, the more you break yourself. And breaking the self is the first step to opening up the doors. Once you achieve that, then you will actually become stronger than you ever were before. Because nothing can break you after that. Once you've broken yourself, nothing can break you after that. There is no humiliation that you can... You see, people actually humiliate themselves. The, the reality of the human being is that no one can humiliate you. Unless you put yourself in a situation whereby you humiliate yourself. So people actually humiliate themselves. You see, so your greatest enemy in this case is yourself. And once you defeat yourself, no one can touch you. Because you've just beaten your greatest enemy. Who else is going to cause any damage on you? <laughs> right? So my advice to you, to everyone who, who feels that it's difficult. Because Dean is a struggle. You see, Ghazali t says this, Dean is struggle. Deen is not, is not easy and this is why people end up falling off the path. Deen is a struggle and you have to keep fighting. You have to keep persevering. You have to keep doing it, no matter how difficult it becomes because that's the steep path. فَلَقْتَهَمَ الْعَقَبَ He has not yet risen the steep path, even though he's been given all these faculties. What will make you understand what the steep path is? Read that surah. Go back and read that surah, Surah Al-Balad. And look at what, how he explains it to you. What is the steep path? It's highlighted, right? I'm not going to go into it, but do it yourself. Look at it yourself. And then connect with what he's telling you. What is the steep path and what it entails? Because look at the Prophet Sallallahu in Taif. What, what was his situation when in Taif? How he was, he was really brought down. And he is, he's outside um, of the city of the town. And Jibreel comes to him and tells him, just give the command. There is an angel waiting. You give the command. He's going to take that mountain and crush it upon them. And the Prophet says, no, let them be. Even though they humiliated him. No, let them be. But then he says something else, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If this is the path you have chosen me, for me, because he asks, where are you going to send me next? Wherever you send me next, so long as you're happy with me, so long as you're pleased with me, I'm ready to go wherever you will send me next. This is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at his most humble, you know, SubhanAllah. Anyway, now, is, is there any other, any other question? Okay, inshallah, we can end for today because I just heard the adhan for Maghrib. So, we'll end for today, inshallah. And I will encourage you to please keep that discussion going in the group. Don't, don't let, because I sometimes, I don't always, you know, come on online to see. Um, but sometimes I do and I don't see any activity. I don't see anybody, you know, discussing anything. Keep the discussion going between yourselves. I'm not going to participate in that. The group was meant for you people, not for me. It wasn't meant for me to broadcast what I think about everything. It was meant for you to, to communicate with each other and to discuss and to expand yourselves in understanding. 
So, you know, keep the discussion going between yourselves. And I'm, I'm just going to observe. And I'm, I'm happy when I saw, when I saw that small discussion that, that you had, I was, I was pleased with that, Alhamdulillah. So please keep that going between yourselves. Now, let's end here, inshallah. Subhanaka wa bihamdika, nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت سميع عليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت تواب الرحيم بفضل سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين جزاكم الله خيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله جزاك الله